Hi, my name is uh, Nasir Hussain. Um, I'm a decision scientist uh, where companies based at Imperial College. I originally come from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this is where I developed, or I was involved in forecasting. And as you know, with the pharma industry, you can spend a billion dollars and still end up uh, with nothing. Uh, um, and then we realized some of our uncertainty modeling techniques can be used in areas like aerospace defense and petrochemical engineering. Huge deployment risks in year two and three, what do you do? Uh, and I'll be talking about that today. My uh, role in cybersecurity is actually, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, um, but we are doing a job with the Ministry of Defense in cybersecurity uh, around software procurement and how that can sort of bring to the fourth vulnerabilities and threat analysis. Um, a, a unique fact about me, you know my name is Nasser Hussain, believe you or not, I actually played with Nasser Hussain cricket in Ilford Cricket Club. <laughs> <laughs> So the first disclaimer is, uh, this one here by Niels Bohr, the prediction is very difficult, particularly if it's about the future, and I do work in future scenarios and contingency to plan. We're based on Imperial College, we use algorithms, and, and some scientific methods I'll show you in, in a few moments. Now the first thing is, is that many executives, uh, this is not my quote, this is the quote from Dennis Cheesley, which just came out about two weeks ago, that the cyber is the one that will define the next generation. But then we have smaller companies, smaller than PwC, saying, you know, I'm not going to read this statement down, there. there's another statement out here. I think the important thing here is, is the complexity of the role of the individual. But it's not just the individual, it's not the CIO or CISO, this is a broad level now, but this actually impacts at different levels of the organisation, you know, employees, managerial, and the, the way this is transmitted. I think this is the other thing, is that, yes, the board is spending a lot of money, but one of the problems with the board is that the average board member, in, you know, for a FTSE 100 company, is between 55 and 65. They're not particularly IT proficient. And one of the biggest problems you find with boards is they don't have the skill set. And so the diversity of thought is not just have uh, enough women on the board or enough black people on the board. We'll have the skill set on the board. That's, that's the bigger question. And yesterday I was at Harvey and actually this is exactly the problem we were discussing as well. So the board might want to spend money, but does the board know why it's spending money? And uh, the other question the board has to ask is, how long am I here for? You know, because the average lifetime is going to take four years before you move on. So the change agents actually are managers in the organization, so they have to get transmitted down. Right, so, so cyber threats has been a cover a wide range of electronic uh, threat scenarios to corporations. So the question is for the board and actually for all of us is what is the right question? And this is the area that I tend to work in, or we tend to work in. First of all, how would the threat of cybersecurity reshape our global business in 2035? And I'm saying 2035 because for a reason, and you know this for a, in a second. What's our business continuity planning in the face of multiple uncertain cyber futures? And I'll tell you why there's multiple uncertain cyber futures. And how do we, this is the important thing is, right now, how do we transform ourselves so that we adopt a sort of cyber threat posture? Okay. And again, I think David talked about that, that we need to take responsibility over everyone in the organization. So the reason why we covered scenarios at 2035 from now is that uh, for the you know, times and you know, sorry, time and trends and events to come to full fruition. Okay, can you actually wait for these you know, events to take place because of, of the huge reputational and financial costs uh, you know, that, that you're going to get hit with? Now the problem with most organisations is this: is that that's what they focus on. Okay. Okay, it's a single view of the future, which is clear enough. But you know, there's some organizations that might get to this level. There's some alternative futures here, and you need to plan for the alternative futures. As provided, you know, the board is tracking these alternative futures, and you're, you're not a cyber risk, but the business contingency risk, the enterprise risk, all these people are working together. Then there's some organizations, actually, that are a bit more sort of, um, I feel like, expansive. And they say, well, actually, there's a range of possible futures here. And then actually we get people, and actually no one's looking into this. This is no one knows. Yeah, okay. There's true ambiguity. And actually I work in these two areas. This, that's, that's the company that I, uh, what we do with our algorithms. So in principle, there exists actually a multiple set of futures. Um, so the question we ask ourselves, and we work with a number of organizations, how does technology impact upon our business? Scenarios? And we develop this matrix here, which is not very readable. Okay, technology trends, um, desired benefits, vulnerabilities in the cyberspace, who are the threat actors, and I've got a bored youngster here, I have someone from Belfast. But you know, you've got syndicated uh, professional groups, you know, who operate from Eastern you know, Europe. You know, what's the mode of operation, um, if I can read it myself, uh, what is the, the motive of the attack, 
There's different motives why you're doing it. For example, it could be public embarrassment like Ashley Madison to espionage that Lockheed Martin found. They never disclosed, but they reckon they lost about $300 million. It was never disclosed. So $35 million is peanuts, I guess. And it's even more money which is being lost. Um, now, the, the thing is, if you, there are actually over 1.5 million scenarios in this field. This is actually a small field. And that number comes from simply multiplying 1, 2, 3, all of this by these cells. And the question is, where does the critical option lie? Which, uh, what, where does this, what are the scenarios? And how you cluster the scenarios? And you know, how you develop strategies against those things as well? And um, I won't have time to dis display this um, uh, because of the time limitation. So actually, in reality, there's not 1.5 million scenarios. This chap here, Jim Dayton, who I met about 10 years ago, continued growth. You either get collapse. You either, get, you either become disciplined in terms of fiscal discipline or, um, or in terms of the market you, you serve, or you become transformative. Okay. Now, um, and these are the companies that, you know, they're not cybersecurity, but just to illustrate what I mean by these four concepts. So we see Microsoft with continued growth. Arthur Anderson has collapsed. They had a Kodak moment, so they become a bit more disciplined. And this was transformative at Apple. Okay, so these are the type of scenarios that, you know, come out from this multi-dimensional matrix that we work with. Right, now the problem we have is that this is actually a bit of a wicked problem developing scenarios. And um, you guys might have heard of what a wicked problem is. Um, I'll go through this relatively quickly. It was actually coined by a Italian web at Berkeley in the early 70s. Uh, it was a German chap who said, actually, wicked means satanic. Uh, so I can't use a German word, although we use words like Chardin for it, you know, we borrow words. But this is one of the rare occasions where the Germans actually borrowed that word. Which that just means it. And a wicked problem is defined by nine sort of characteristics which actually fit what's happening in organizations at the moment. One is there's no clear definition of a problem statement. Secondly, it's socially and politically complex. People are passing the buck, people are moving around. Third, is strongly stakeholder orientated. This is my department, this is my silo, don't step on it, don't tread on it. You know, I've got my, my, you know, I'm responsible to my land manager, not to the organization itself. Secondly, because we live in a hugely complex world in the finance and fintech space. So there's huge interdependencies and causes which are not terribly well understood. This is the big problem. The problem does not lie within any the responsibility of any one organization. Okay, although huge amounts of money are spent in meetings and so forth. So we would stand the consulting methods leads to unintended consequences, sometimes just miss the boat like talk talk, being a chronic policy failure, policy criticism, problems of state remains, develops, and so forth. So what we try to do is work in a bizarre area uh, called post-normal science, where facts are uncertain, values in dispute, stakes are high, and decisions are urgent. And we work with what we've done is post-normal science. So this is where the decision takes are very high and the system's uncertainty is extraordinarily high. And this is where some of the algorithms and decision sciences uh, uh, tend to work in. Developed by these two guys, Fultovich and Rabbit. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting this chap. Um, he's probably about 90 now, this chap. Um, um, he, he had to leave the US because of McCarthyism. So he's actually based in Britain now. <laughs> so, so like, now the problem is, is, what kind of scenario plan technique would you do? Now, there's hundreds of them. As well. And what we tend to do, if I go back, we tend to focus on this method, which is unique to us. I'm not going to go through the, the various methodologies of how you develop scenarios, but we tend to use this method here, but then there's other methods you can use as well, which I want you know, going to go into here. The point is this. This is a small field that we developed for the Swedish government in emergency response planning. The previous field I showed you had 1.5 million options. This one actually is a small one. It only has, actually, 57 or 58,000, but actually with, uh, with people in the organization over a two-day period, they realized there were actually only 12 scenarios that they concentrate on. And they were clustered into the collapse, transformative, um, disciplined, and continued growth. Now you've put strategies against that, but this was developed with consensus. That's the, that, that was the key trick here. So, and that's one scenario which is shown here by a red line. I just want to end up with one or two slides. So you need to develop global scenarios, and what you need to ask yourself is, what's my control strategy for each scenario? It's only four, four major scenarios. You will never get rid of risks, so there's always uncertainty to residual risk, and then what the board or the company has to decide is, do, what's my risk appetite for that as well? And how do I mo monitor that risk appetite? So when I, when I make the implementation, 
is it actually working, which is known as efficacy? Actually, how much is it costing us, which is efficiency? These are metrics that you can actually develop. One is effectiveness, which is different from efficacy. I, long term, is it make an impact, change behavior, good people behavior, finance, so forth. The biggest problem, what we find is elegance and ethicality, which are qualitative measures, is, is, is this intervention or the strategy so clunky that it's, it's difficult to implement and no one's going to buy into this? And the other thing is ethicality. Actually, this is actually even acceptable. You know? I mean, if you look at governments, one is law enforcement, while they will hack into your systems, but one is also espionage. What's the spectrum of ethicality there? So, if you speak to GSHQ, that is national defence, but GSHQ can also, you know, tap into other parts of the world, and it, it could be used for many different nefarious purposes or defensive purposes. Anyway, this is who we are. Uh, we're decision scientists, based in Imperial College, sporting groups and senior management teams in contingency planning and scenarios. And um, what we do is basically do uses algorithms to develop a very visual model. You can see where you are and what kind of options you get. And we're based at Imperial College. So thank you very much for that.